What's up everybody? Welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be telling you all a little story about Intel. In this story, I'm going to be presenting the argument for why Intel stock is currently being mispriced by the market and why it presents a great long-term opportunity. In this video, I'm going to be going over the history of the company, the history of its competition with AMD, the significant problems that the company is currently facing regarding its manufacturing, and why it still presents a great long-term investment opportunity. So let's not waste any time and let's get right into it. Intel was founded in 1968 by two brilliant engineers, Robert Noyce and Gordon Moore. Robert Noyce was a co-inventor of the first silicon integrated circuit in 1958 while he was serving as general manager at Fairchild Semiconductor. Gordon Moore, during the same time, was serving as the head of research and development at Fairchild Semiconductor, and you probably know Gordon Moore because he is the one that developed Moore's Law in 1965. And at that time, Moore's Law stated that the number of transistors on a semiconductor chip will roughly double every single year. He later revised the law in 1975, where he stated that the number of transistors that can fit on a chip will roughly double every two years. Now this law has been absolutely foundational to the semiconductor industry and is what continues to drive competitors to innovate and increase the computing power of their chips. It has also been absolutely foundational to the technology industry as a whole because all technological devices rely on semiconductors to act as the brain of the device and by increasing the computing power of the semiconductor chips you are also increasing the technological capabilities of the devices that are using them. So for that reason, Moore's Law has been a foundational principle underlying the technology industry and is what has made Gordon Moore a legend among Silicon Valley elites. Now, while Intel today is best known for its microprocessing units, the company's first big success actually came from a memory chip. Intel was the first company to produce a memory chip that was able to store a significant amount of information. This chip was the Dynamic Random Access Memory Chip, more commonly known as a DRAM and Intel dominated the DRAM market for the majority of the 1970s until the company underwent the first major inflection point where they shifted their focus away from memory chips and over towards microprocessing units. And this transformation was so drastic that Intel's market share fell from 82% in 1974 to just 1.3% 1 in 1984. In a decade, they had shifted all of their resources away from memory chips over to microprocessing units. And a big factor in this was that in 1981, Intel was chosen to supply the microprocessors that would be used in IBM's first mass-produced personal computer. Now in this mass-produced PC, the operating system used was Microsoft's Windows. And this combination of Intel and Windows became so popular that the combination was dubbed Wintel. Now during the 80s and 90s, this success led Intel to maintain market dominance over the CPU market, and it wasn't until the early 2000s that Intel started to face some significant competition from its competitor, AMD. AMD, similar to Intel, was founded by an ex-employee of Fairchild Semiconductor. However, the founder of AMD was a much more volatile personality and he loved to live a lavish lifestyle. This trickled down into the company which did not have a very long-term focus as the founder of the company didn't have a very long-term focus and it led AMD to always being behind Intel in terms of innovation. That was until 1995 when AMD purchased the company NextGen, who was led by an extremely competent individual named Raza, who was able to turn AMD around and finally help the company produce a product that would be able to compete with Intel. By the early 2000s, however, AMD had realized that they would not just need an excellent product in order to compete with Intel, they would need to improve their manufacturing capabilities so that they can produce these chips at scale in order to take away market share from Intel. In 2001, AMD announced that they were going to start outsourcing their manufacturing so that they could finally compete with Intel and produce the scale that they needed in order to start taking away market share. Now this period in the early 2000s was marked by intense competition between the two companies. And it wasn't a very good period for Intel at all. Intel's woes began in the year 2000 when AMD introduced the Athlon chip, which was the first one gigahertz microprocessing unit available on the market. This marked the beginning of AMD's slow chipping away at Intel's market share in the CPU market. By 2006, AMD and Intel had very similar market share positions in the CPU market, 
with Intel just slightly edging AMD out. However, investors during this period believed that AMD was going to surpass Intel in terms of market share leadership and become the new market leader in the CPU market. And this was clear in the stock price of the company during that period, as in 2003, AMD stock was trading at $3.50 and rose all the way to $42 a share by 2006. This marks over a tenfold increase in just a three year time period. And it might sound familiar because we are seeing something very similar to AMD stock price, except on a much larger scale. AMD stock price went from a low of around $1.80 in 2015, and in the most recent trading session is trading at $86 per share. Now that represents over a 40 times increase in the market value of AMD. That is because investors again believe that AMD is going to surpass Intel in terms of their market leadership position and is also going to be challenging Nvidia in terms of the GPU market share. But let's get back to what happened in the early 2000s because it's going to be important in assessing the current situation that Intel is in. Now while AMD was taking away market share from Intel during the early 2000s, Intel was also facing a lot of legal issues. They had been sued by the EU for $1.45 billion because of alleged monopolistic actions. And on top of that, AMD also sued Intel in 2004 for anti-competitive practices. For this, Intel had to pay AMD $1.25 billion in the year 2009. However, during this time, Intel signed a lucrative contract with Apple, and they also introduced one of the most successful marketing campaigns in history. Now, the marketing campaign that Intel used was the Intel Inside sticker that would be placed on any computer or laptop using an Intel microprocessor. This made Intel a household name, and even consumers who weren't very tech savvy or even understood what a microprocessor was, would seek out computers that were using Intel microprocessors. This increased the brand value for Intel, and it served to increase Intel's market share in the coming years. On top of that, they signed a lucrative deal with Apple to be the supplier of the microprocessing unit in Apple computers, which displaced the chips that Apple had been using up to that point, which were being sourced from Motorola, as Apple and Motorola had a great relationship spanning all the way back from the 80s. But in 2005, Steve Jobs made the decision to start using Intel microprocessors, which just added to the brand value of Intel as they were associated with an excellent brand like Apple computers. By 2007, Intel had already begun taking back that market share that they lost from AMD, and AMD had fallen from grace with investors as the stock price plunged over 90% in the coming years. Now, Intel maintained that market share leadership because of the excellent brand that they had built up over the last decade, which now made Intel a household name. In addition to that, they had also leveraged their extremely large research and development capabilities to come out with a superior product to AMD in order to retain market share leadership for the next decade. Until in 2015-2016, they started to slowly lose market share to AMD once again. This leads us into what is happening to Intel's stock today and why investors are so pessimistic about the company compared to other semiconductor stocks like AMD and Nvidia. In 2016, Intel announced that they're going to be shifting the focus of the company from a PC centric model to a data center model. Now this is due to the increased amounts of data that we are going to be processing as an economy due to the introduction of new technologies like AI, 5G, cloud computing, and edge computing, which are gonna increase the demand for data centers around the world. Now, I think that this inflection is an extremely important one for Intel, and I'm very happy to see that they have dedicated a lot of resources to becoming a leader in the data center market. And I think that it's gonna to prove to be a very successful path for the company in the future. Now, the company is undoubtedly facing significant manufacturing problems. They recently announced the delay of their seven nanometer chip to late 2022, whereas AMD is already producing a seven nanometer chip. Now, when I'm talking about nanometers, what I'm referring to is the size of the transistors that are being placed on the semiconductor chip. The smaller the size of the transistors, the more transistors that can be placed on the chip, thus increasing the computing power of that chip. However, given that we are now getting to such small transistor sizes, the relationship isn't as linear as it used to be in the past. So having smaller transistors doesn't necessarily translate into having a faster processor. However, a lot of investors see a seven nanometer versus a 10 nanometer, and they believe that that's the end all be all, which isn't necessarily true, but it is still definitely an advantage to have a seven nanometer manufacturing process versus the 10 nanometer that Intel is still stuck on. 
Now, the reason why AMD and NVIDIA are able to access seven nanometer transistor manufacturing processes is not because they are manufacturing this themselves, they are outsourcing it to Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company. Now, probably the best strategy you can have, regardless of what happens between AMD and Intel, is to purchase Taiwan Semiconductor because of the fact that they're going to be supplying the parts and they are the ones that are the global leaders in the manufacturing of semiconductor chips. But I digress, and we're going to focus mostly on what's going on between Intel and AMD in this video. So AMD, as they had outsourced their manufacturing all the way back in 2001, haven't been manufacturing their own chips for a long time. So they've been leveraging TSM's manufacturing capabilities to come out with a 7 nanometer chip well before Intel was able to catch up. And on top of that, Intel has delayed their product launch by about two years, which has made investors very pessimistic on Intel's ability to compete in the future. This sounds very similar to what happened in the early 2000s. However, I'm going to give you guys some reasons why I believe Intel is still a great long-term investment. Now, before I get into explaining why I believe Intel still makes a long-term investment, I want to be clear that I do not know if they will be able to overcome the significant obstacles that they're facing in their manufacturing capabilities. What I can do is assess whether taking on the risk of investing in Intel is going to be commensurate with the return I expect to make from my investment. Nobody, not Warren Buffett, not Jimmy Buffett, knows if the stock market is going to go up, down, sideways, or in f circles. And anybody who does claim that they know whether Intel, AMD, or Nvidia is going to win this race is probably coming from a place of overconfidence. So with that in mind, what I am going to do is I'm going to explain the advantages that Intel currently has over the competitors and how they will be able to leverage those in order to increase the probability of overcoming the obstacles they're currently facing and continuing to drive value for us as shareholders. So the first factor that is going to aid Intel in their ability to make a comeback from the current delays in production that they're facing is the massive resource capabilities that they have compared to their competitors. You can see this very clearly by taking a look at Intel's R&D expenditure compared to its competitors. Intel's R&D expenditure blows out of the water both AMD and Nvidia, and even if you combine the two entities, they still wouldn't even come close to how much Intel is able to spend in R&D. This not only allows Intel to remain on the cutting edge and remain the market leader in terms of product development, but it allows them to create a larger product ecosystem. Now, I already know what you're thinking. Yes, that R&D expenditure didn't help Intel stay ahead of the competition in terms of their manufacturing capabilities, and that is absolutely true. Their R&D did not help them in being able to combat TSM's rapid rise to success in terms of the manufacturing process within the semiconductor industry. However, they are still the product development leader within the industry, and they still do have the best products on the market, as many industry experts will attest to. So while they are able to produce excellent products, the wider ecosystem is also going to help them succeed in the future of the data center market because they're going to be providing chips that not only power the devices that are going to be producing the data, but they're going to be producing the chips that are actually processing the data in the data centers. And through this, they're going to be able to create synergies between their products and they're going to be able to create a product ecosystem that works better if it's all Intel products than if a data center were to use some NVIDIA products, some AMD products. So by being able to create a product ecosystem, they're going to be able to raise the switching costs for a lot of their customers. And this is going to create a sustainable advantage for Intel in the future. Now, I know you're all thinking that, well, that doesn't really matter if they fall behind the competition in terms of manufacturing. And while I think manufacturing is a short term problem for Intel, Manufacturing was a competitive advantage for Intel, but if we look at their competitors, none of them do in-house manufacturing. So the way I see it, Intel has two ways to solve this issue. They can fix their in-house problems, which they are currently working on now, or they can switch to outsourcing in the future and follow the same path as their competitors. Either way, they are still the best product development company in the semiconductor industry. So whichever path they take, they are still going to be able to compete against their competitors like AMD and Nvidia. Ideally, they'll be able to solve these manufacturing problems and be able to compete with TSM. However, if they don't, there is still a viable option in outsourcing the manufacturing of their products. So these massive resource capabilities that Intel possesses are going to provide it with a significant competitive advantage compared to its competitors for the foreseeable future. And it's an advantage that competitors can't do anything about because Intel is so massive that they can leverage these resources in a way that their competitors cannot. The second reason why Intel still makes a solid investment is that they are cash cows. 
They generate so much cash for shareholders and on average they have redistributed 97% of free cash flows back to their shareholders over the last decade. On top of that, the free cash flow growth that the company has been experiencing over the last decade has outpassed the revenue growth that the company has been generating over the last decade, which showcases that the company is becoming more efficient. And a lot of this is stemming from the fact that the data center group is producing higher margins than the PC center group. And in addition to that, the data center group is also growing at a much more rapid pace than the PC center group. The data center group in the most recent quarter grew at a year over year rate of over 30%, while the PC center group grew at only 7%. So this shows that Intel is still growing very rapidly in the data center group, regardless of the manufacturing issues that they're currently facing. And the fact that they are acquiring companies like Mobileye and Habana Labs shows that they are still focused on becoming the market leaders in terms of providing products for the AI, 5G, cloud computing, and edge computing industries. So as I said, I don't know if they're going to be able to fix the manufacturing problems, but the fact that Intel is such a well-managed company that redistributes cash flows to shareholders, they're very good at making the right acquisitions, and they're investing in the right segments of the business, tells me that Intel has a reasonable probability of being able to make a comeback and continue producing value for us as shareholders. Taking a look at their valuation, the intrinsic value that I calculated using the value of growth model places the intrinsic value of Intel at $69 per share. As it's currently trading around $49 per share, that's giving you over a 30% margin of safety on your entry price, which shows you just how undervalued Intel is. And as you know, I don't like to use PE or price to book just to justify a valuation, but Intel is currently trading at a price to earnings ratio of nine compared to AMD who's trading at a PE of 165 and Nvidia who's trading in the upper 90s. So that just shows you how pessimistic the market is, even though Intel is going to be experiencing high levels of growth in the future. So for this reason, I think that Intel is a growth stock that is currently being valued as a value stock, which is probably one of the best combinations you can have in a stock and is why I am so bullish on the company. Do you disagree with my opinion? I'd love to hear it in the comment section down below. And if you know somebody who thinks that I'm wrong, share this video with them and I'd love to hear their opinions in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new and I look forward to seeing you all in my next video.